Okay. This is a presentation by the Historical Society of Harford County, and I am Mary Schwears. A uh, little bit about my background. I started genealogy about 12, 13 years ago, and uh, about 10 years ago, I started wondering if I was doing it right, because I was following on leaves and basically doing a lot of things wrong. So I took the Boston University 15-week uh, course on genealogical research, and then I continued on with um, classes in forensic genealogy. I've been involved with the Harf County Historical Society for over 10 years. And I am in charge of the, or myself and Chris are co-chairs of the genealogical education program. And um, we are excited about the program we have for you today. This presentation will deal with topics that may make you uncomfortable, but um, they're modern day political concerns. And we are going to address how to deal with some of those concerns. Our ancestors were human. They made mistakes. We should bring. Huh? Have you shared the screen? Oh. Ha ha ha, that might help, huh? Okay, wait a minute. Let me go back in here. Share screen. Now, can you see it? Yes, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. All right. They made mistakes. They committed crimes. They lied. And Chris will go into a really interesting program about that later. And they had issues, uh, they failed, they struggled, but a lot of those things don't get passed on exactly as they happened. And for, in that way, a lot of stories get created and a lot of um, beliefs are held by the families. A good genealogist finds the skeletons. And one of the things that we're taught as a professional genealogist is to do an initial interview with the client. And the most important you can ask, important question you can ask is, is there anything you don't want to know? And that's sort of a protection to to prevent you from being uh, chastised for finding the truth and they don't wanna know it. I'm gonna share one of my own skeletons today. It's my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. I'm named after her, um, Mary Etta Hurley. She was born in Jefferson, North Carolina in October of 1920. She died at age 88 in 2009. Her first husband was Edwin Wiley Powers. Um, they got married November 26, 1938 in Ashe, North Carolina, Ashe County, and three children. Um, Evelyn, that's how they pronounced her name, Caroline. She was born June 7th. My mother, Wileen, was born June 1st in, um, in 1941, and Ray was born May 31st, 1942. Now, no one talked about Ray. 
I never knew about him until I started doing genealogical research and I found his death certificate. He died at about two months of age from an ailment that almost killed my mother when she was born. And uh, uh, that had a big effect on my grandmother for the rest of her life. But when I found out about Ray, I called my mom and I said, did you have a brother, Ray? And she goes, yeah. So I was 50 some years old before I found out I had an uncle Ray and, um, and that he had died quite early. But the real skeleton, um, Edwin died in 1952 in an accidental drowning in Hamden Grace, Maryland. He, we never knew how he died. We, we just knew he died near a bridge. That's all we were told. But Mary later married Benjamin Owen. They divorced a few years later due to his alcoholism. And then Mary worked as a cook in a nursing home. She was always very prim and proper, a true Southern lady. She made the best coffee, tea. She worked in a place um, in Southern Maryland called Normandy Farms for a while. And she actually served tea to Eleanor Roosevelt. So she was, she was a very good cook, a very proper lady. Then we come to her third husband. This is Columbus Jack McGraw. And his birth information is to the right there. That's what I pulled up. And he was quite a few years younger than her, about eight or nine years younger. And um, she, she was ecstatic about him. She was just in love. I remember them together all the time. Jack was an amazing person. He was very comical. He, um, he liked uh, radio soap operas and he taught me to like them. But if you'll notice, he was born in North Carolina. And um, so that's his information right there. So Grandma and Jack got married and just, if everybody can see the screen, just let me know if you notice anything weird on the certificate. Oh, you guys can't talk. Um, you should notice that he switched his first name and his middle name and that he states he was born in South Carolina. Now, um, <clears throat> at a family gathering, not too long after my aunt died in 2019, we started talking about Jack and I started wanting more information, especially about his death. Jack died May 21st, 1969. His body was found on the railroad tracks in Hamity Grace. He had just been released from jail. He was staying in a local hotel due to a fight that he had with my grandmother. His body was unidentifiable and they had to use fingerprints. And as you can see on the death certificate, an autopsy was completed. And thanks to the helpful information from Chris, I found out that if an autopsy was completed, that a lot of times there is access through the Maryland archives. So sure enough, um, his re autopsy records were in the archives. Uh, some are now protected under medical records standards. So you really have to check and see what you can get access to. Uh, through Maryland, at least, you can apply to view the autopsy. Uh, this includes photographs, so just be prepared for that. And police reports are often included. So there's the call record. And there is the morgue record. And you can see at first he was an unknown and then they identified him as Columbus Jack McGraw. 
And there were police reports. Um, that this one was done by Chief Walker, who I knew. Um, they hadn't been able to find out where he'd been staying. Um, and it goes in details uh, about different things, but he had just gotten out of jail. And another thing that I found out was his father had died while he was in jail. So that's why he was despondent and depressed. And when he came home to my grandmother, they had a fight and either she kicked him out or he left and he was staying at a nearby motel and um, and then it goes into details about how the body was found. I started looking for information about Jack. Um, he was in service in 1951. He was stationed at Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Kansas. And I did find information that he had gotten married and they had, uh, and they had a daughter. Um, I couldn't find a marriage certificate. I'm still looking for that. But um, so this proves that he was indeed married, but on the marriage certificate, he, he said he was divorced. But we come to find out going through my aunt's things after she passed away, that when grandma applied for her social security, the um, state of Maryland, who can find out everything, uh, did write her back and say that um, your husband's prior marriage had not ended when you married him. You do not meet the second requirement because it does not apply since your husband's legal widow is entitled to benefit on his accident. So Jack was never divorced. It was a bigamy situation. And my grandmother knew that, but she never talked about it. And, to, and as of this day, she is buried next to Jack in the graveyard not too far from here. And she continued to love him that much. There are a lot of stories in the families and different things that we hear, but you should never follow the story. You should always follow the evidence. And those include vital records, newspapers, court cases, the census, even though I know a lot of um, people don't fully trust the census, they can give you a lot of information and different archives. Uh, this is another little skeleton in the closet I found. This is my third great-grandfather, John Craig. He came over from Ireland right around the ending of the potato famine. And he actually owned a hotel not too far from here. And this is a case where he was charged with serving uh, alcohol to a customer. Um, Harford County was a dry county, so alcohol wasn't allowed, and he, he, he beat the rap by saying, well, I, I gave him a little blackberry wine, but they didn't pay for it. They bought some cigars, and I love the way they spell cigars, S-E-G-A-R-S. With you being the researcher, you're going to be the first to make the discovery. So what the first thing you need to do is verify the evidence. Make sure what you have is enough to prove them guilty of this situation. And if you're telling someone else this, you, you have to gauge your presentation to the audience. Um, you, you may not want to tell an older family member something, or if it's somebody with strong opinions, you, you, you may want to have the um, 
had multiple pieces of evidence before in order to convince them. Don't be surprised if they don't believe you or even question your abilities. Um, this hasn't happened to me yet, but I know uh, of some other genealogists who have act actually had people start screaming at them and um, uh, storm out of the room. In my family, the one thing that I experienced was I found out my great grandmother family changed their name from Schumacher to Shoemake. And so at a funeral, when they had Shoemake written on the card, I said something to the family about it's really Schumacher. And they got upset and they actually stopped talking to me uh, for a while until I was able to convince them. The um, and you may have clients who refuse to pay because you simply do not know what you're doing. This isn't how it was. So uh, as a genealogist, you have to be prepared for those things. And now we're gonna start talking about current skeletons such as if you find out your ancestors were slave owners. And what you have to make sure of is that what happened in the past is not reflected in your actions now. And you may be surprised the number of people looking for information on slave ancestors. So don't be afraid to reach out and share the information. Uh, recently, we had an inquiry at the Historical Society on people looking for a way to connect um, two families. Well, one was African American and the other one was white, and they had the same names and they were from the same area, and they were trying to connect to see if they um, were, in fact, uh, the slaves that were owned or the, the family uh, of the slaves that were owned. You can use DNA in some cases um, because not always were relations with the slaves um, in a, Often slaves were used for other reasons. I'll just put it that way. And so you may find out there's a DNA connection to uh, families of color or, fam or families of the owners. You may suddenly feel guilty for something you had no part in. And I recommend a book called Slaves in the Family by Edward Ball. I've been reading it as I've been working towards this seminar. It's an excellent, uh, an excellent story on how a man found out that his family was slave owners and he did research to reconnect uh, with the families and how he came to terms with everything and how he uh, made peace with the family. It's a very good book. Um, I have uh, ancestors who were slave owners as noted here, and I've done some work, but African-American uh, genealogy is very complicated. And our next speaker, Iris Barnes, is going to go into some detail on that. It's very interesting. And even if you don't have this situation, as a genealogist, you may be asked to help or give advice in that situation. So it's very helpful to know. For search methods, um, 
search as many records as you can to document the family. Name changed quite frequently in African American families. Uh, and so you, you may see a few different names. Use census to find families in the area with the same first names and ages. So if you if you find out that they suddenly disappeared, go through the census, and I, I know it can be tedious, use the census to find families in the area with the same first names and ages. And that may give you information on what they changed their name to. And Older documents use terms that we do not find appropriate today, so don't be upset about that. Uh, if they're not listed on what was classified as the colored register, look for more information under white. There were a lot of mistakes made registering race. Uh, I ran into one family one time in West Virginia um, who suddenly disappeared and they, they were white, but they were suddenly listed on the color register. Family wills are a good source. And finding the connection from former slave owners to the slaves is very difficult. Only about 50% of professionals can successfully complete um, the connection. And always look for the good. Chris, I know you'll remember this one. Uh, one day we had a gentleman come in to the um, historical society and he was looking for information on his family. And he was, he was African American. And Chris walked up to me and said, you're related to the Carroll family, right? And I said, right. And he said um, that my ancestor had testified on behalf of his ancestor and got him out of a, um, a nasty uh, charge. And he was, he was not, um, prosecuted for uh, harming this man. So always look for the good. Confederates. It's an evolving issue and um, a lot of people have feelings on both sides. Um, I had a Confederate ancestor. My uh, third, one of my third great grandfathers died in Gettysburg. He was with the um, North Carolina Regiment and he fought on the Confederate side, even though I can never find any proof that he or his family owned slaves. I think it was just a matter of fighting for their homeland as they considered it. Um, most descendants of Confederate heroes have, have agreed with the removal of statues and other monuments uh, as a lot of families are removing Confederate markers from graves. In fact, I'm working on a case right now um, with a family from Virginia in, and who have relatives in a local cemetery and we are working on getting their, any Confederate markers removed from those graves. Most people who have um, counseled on this issue recommend to come to terms with the history, not the hate, and to acknowledge the service, not the cause. Pretendians, that's another thing that came up recently in the last election. Now, what you have to remember is a lot of tribes still classify um, tribe members 
by blood and you if you verify that you have a native Indi a native american heritage you can be enrolled into a tribe okay and the the bloodline is becoming very dilute um, but that keeps the tribe stronger and in order to be enrolled you need a certificate of degree of Indian blood card. They're issued by the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And um, DNA is not, te te DNA testing is not accepted by in, in any tribe. So if you have a ancestor of Indian heritage, you, you can um, look into this book. It's called Blood Politics, Race, Culture, and Identity in the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Of course, there are other tribes and other potential heritages, but this gives you an idea of how Native American heritage is looked at by the tribe and how the... Uh, the process is identified. It's an excellent book. I read it a number of years ago when I was looking through the um, through some heritage. I had a great uncle who was a uh, Confederate deserter and actually married a Cherokee woman in Cherokee County, North Carolina. And her name was Nikita Redfern. But I have been unable to find them on any other records. So then we go into what are classified as $5 Indians. Now, back when the Dawes Commission was established, they were required to registrar um, anybody with Native American membership. But what often came with this was land. And we all know land was what everybody strived for. So some people paid $5 to falsify documents declaring them as Native on the Dolls Roll. And this is, this is a big controversy even today where there are people on the dolls rolls, but their brothers and sisters and other family members are not. And it was because they may have falsified the documents. And this was a little bit risky because a Native American classification also came with a lot of uh, issues and problems and potential retributions. So just going that way for some land was a big risk. They passed on the heritage to, um, I spelled heirs wrong, who still claim Native American history. So that's where the pretendians or the $5 Indian stigma comes through. The Dawes rolls are still used as a standard for Native American history. They are no known to be flawed extensively. And um, Many real Native Americans uh, fought enrollment because they didn't trust the government. And so you may have ancestors on there who are not, um, uh, or you may have ancestors who are not enrolled on there. Uh, if they were found and they were not, enumerated on the dolls rolls, they were arrested and forced to register. And another interesting thing, Native Americans also um, 
were slave owners. So anybody who was enslaved by the Native Americans were also enrolled. And the last thing we're gonna talk about, I'm getting done a little bit early, is um, stolen valor, uh, stories of people who were in the war or in the military and you come to find out their tales of service are greatly over exaggerated. Supposedly, you know, they fought in this battle or, you know, did this heroic deed or something and they had all these medals to show for them and you find out they were clerk typist that stationed in New York or something. Um, there's a lot of these around, unearned awards, uh, possible dishonorable discharge, and even sometimes court martials can be uh, discovered in the, in the records. Court martial records up to cases prior to World War I may be accessed through the National Archives. They have the cases there. Newer records after World War I are requested through the National Personnel Records Center. And they have to be either requested or signed off on by the next of kin if the person is deceased. So there may be a little bit more work. Um, I haven't tried searching too much through Fold 3 for those kind of records. And, uh, but in older records, like, you know, Civil War and different things like that, they do talk about um, case, cases of desertion or other things. The, um, this card here I found on Ancestry, it's a deserter pay card from a gentleman who was stationed at the Ordnance School in Aberdeen Proving Ground, and it shows his status as a deserter. So Ancestry is starting to put more of this information online. Another fun book I found is By Your Family Tree, Skeletons in the Cupboard, 70 Real Life Family History Tales of Criminal Deeds, Bed Hopping, Naughtiest, and Scandalous Ancestors. The other skeleton in the closet that comes up, of course, is always the, um, the premarital sex, the uh, uh, the family that suddenly had another child there and no one can figure out where they came from. The, and that can create some tension in family moments too. My great, great, or my great grandparents, um, uh, my great, great grandparents, I looked up their marriage date and my great grandfather was born four months later. And when I introduced that fact into the family, there were just stunned silence. Uh, and I mean, everybody's still talking to me, but it was, it was just a fact of, oh, okay. And uh, so the other thing is multiple marriages. I haven't worked personally on a case like that but I do know they exist where there'll be one family in one area and another family in another area. And uh, those have been found, they can usually be found in the census. And one will usually be listed as a widow at a lot of times. Divorce was very scandalous and people didn't like to 
either go through the process or say they were divorced. So the ex was listed as a widow and then the new family was uh, living in usually in not far proximity from the other family. Okay, now I'm gonna exit from this. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, we've got chat. Is there a handout? Um, no, I do not have a handout. And I covered uh, Robbins and Native Americans also didn't trust the government and avoided registering with the Dolls Commission. Yes, I covered that. Oops. Our mothers were, were born the exact same day, October 23rd, 1920. That was my grandmother. And your mom was born in Iowa. This is from, I can't see who it's from. Yes, Harford County. I know we have a lot of people from all over the United States. Harford County, Maryland and Ash County, North Carolina, for some reason had a lot of exchanges. Uh, uh, people moved from Ash up to North or to Harford County. It became known as the Ash County of the North. Um, and so I have a lot of family members here. I also have a lot of family members in, still in Ash County. And um, but there was a significant population shift from Ash County to Harford County. Okay, are there any other questions? Iris, can you, oh, you're here, okay. Okay. Hi, Iris. You can unmute. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi. Good. Are you ready to go? I finished a little bit early. Oh, okay. I don't know if people were looking for it to start at 11 or did you want to take a break? But I, I am ready if you choose. I don't see where I can. Do you have to give me access to share my screen? Yes, I am. I have to make you host. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I don't seem to have a way to show myself. It says join as a panelist. Yeah. All right. I think I got some features now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hello. Hi. Um, I am going to do a quick introduction. Okay. Um, everybody, this is Iris Barnes. Dr. Barnes is an experienced and award-winning historian and educator. Her scholarship interests range from civil war to civil rights with a particular focus on the tenacity and resi resilience of the African-Americans who survived and thrived against the odds. Currently, she serves as commissioner on the Harf County Historic Preservation Commission and the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture and the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She is a professor at, uh, in the history department at the University of Delaware teaching museum studies. And there you go. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, I'm going to throw some like Mary is, <laughs> but as a historian, researcher, museum professional, I use genealogy a lot, especially when I want to drill down on an individual I'm researching. And so I use some of the same tools and some additional tools and 
of course, mine is towards a, a, a interpretation for either a publication or for um, an exhibition. And so, but um, she asked me to talk a little bit about um, African American experience. I call it. It's. I always like to say it's not just African American history. It's American history through the lens of the African American experience. So when you look at any particular topic, say World War II, you can look at it from different lenses, and the experience will be different. So if you looked at it from women's point of view who were who began to work in factories um, and really bring home the money for the family. And then when the men came back, uh, they were expected to go back into being housewives. And no, no, they, they did not agree with that. And so it really changed our workforce um, and those opportunities for women, but also look at it from the perspective of African-Americans. So they were not actually, a, well, the armed forces at this point were segregated. And not until I think it's Executive Order 8802 with Truman that the armed forces were desegregated. So their experience was completely different. They, we talk about the double V, double victory, and that meant victory over in Europe and victory in the United States. They had to fight two wars, and that um, included when they came back home. Now, they were accepted in various places in Europe, and they're marrying Europeans, and then they come back to the United States, and they're not heroes like others who fought in the war. They are, in fact, targeted or lynched, especially if they were wearing a uniform, and certainly could were segregated against. Um, when they returned. So it was a whole other experience. And so from that lens of the African-American experience, I'm gonna be talking about looking for some records that you can use uh, to help um, finish out or complete your story, fill out the get, fill in the gaps um, when you're writing your story about your family. I love the way Ancestry takes all the information you've acquired and creates its own little story, right? Over to the side, it creates this nice little narrative. That's, that's great. And it's usually some repetitive information and some big gaps. And, and so hopefully some of this will help fill that in. So I am now going to share my screen. Uh, Maria, okay, here we go. Okay, you have to still give me that privilege. All right, are you guys seeing my screen? Is that a yes? Okay, great. All right, here I am. <laughs> so adding on to what Mary started out, she said, you know, there's a lot of people looking to find their, um, they, they may have been descendants of a slaveholder, but they're looking to connect with slave families. And I said, mm, now that's, or the families who were descendants of slaves. And I thought that was a very interesting concept. So um, I'm gonna start with my, my life, my story. And um, I heard her talk about DNA. I got my DNA tested. I wasn't surprised about some of it. So it was about 67% Nigerian, Ghanaian. And we were always told we had that Native American background, but I was surprised it was only about 1%, a little less than that. And then the amount of the Scottish Irish was a little high, but then again, I really wasn't so surprised. And then I saw, started looking, I said, okay, I'm gonna open this up so I can see who some of my cousins are. My dad is from Mississippi 
And then down in Mississippi in Columbus, where he was from, there was a big mall named the Lee Mall. And I thought, ooh, that had to be somebody big. That's, you know, that's my maiden name. And maybe they were slaveholders. I want to know more about that history. And then I I decided to open it up and I saw an Archer. I call them DNA cousins with the surname Archer living in Mississippi. And I thought, gee. So I reached out to this person. Unfortunately, they never got back to me. Archer was someone I was researching. I thought, oh my goodness, what if I'm a descendant of the people I'm researching for my book? And I thought, wow, this would be very exciting. But so far, I haven't found out. But here's my dad. And then I'm going to move this over. And his grandfather, so my great-grandfather, I thought, now my dad had about the same percentages as I had, but Grandpa Jack, he always had us wondering. He looked like, in our eyes, that he was white, and but he identified as Black, and that's always a dilemma with many African-American families. Which way did the ancestor go? Did they identify as Black, or did I, they identify as white? So there's Jack. And the reality check is, hey, everybody, this is America. Let's remember America's history. We were a nation built on the institution of slavery. We can't forget that. And that just figures into who our ancestors were. Slavery included the exploitation of Black women for economic gain. We won't have some more babies. If they're not going to do it on their own, I'll help them out with that. That's the mindset of the slaveholder. But then also it included exploitation just for personal pleasure of the slaveholder. Okay. And so um, this resulted in what we know today is mixed race offspring or biracial children that were biologically children of the slaveholder, yet they were often held as slaves. And an instance here, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, here he is. He, his, one of his famous descendants is Lily Carroll Jackson, Lily Mae Carroll Jackson, who became a huge leader in the NAACP of Baltimore and freedom fighter and worked with Thurgood Marshall and Rosa Parks and others in the Baltimore area to end racial inequality and segregation. Now, Charles Carroll was trying to get, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence from Maryland. But this is a history, this is a real history. We all talk about the Sally Hemings and uh, the other, um, it's covered up here, the other Madisons. And so it's not a new story. But it's a story, especially looking at um, new ways of interpreting at historic sites, particularly presidential homes or plantations that used to just feature the president and his family and all the good um, stories. But today, there's an effort that's been going on maybe five years, really has blown up. Maybe, maybe a little longer, uh, but it's all over. We're looking at universities that are revealing the, the role of slavery and the development of those universities. We're looking at um, back to the presidents or signers of declarations of, of, the, of important US documents and um, how many slaves they had and how many claim to have been descended from that individual. And so the interpretation is now trying to be more inclusive and include those um, enslaved individuals who may have had particular skills, who may have run the farm or plantation, who built the homes, any hard work you can imagine, any dangerous work you can imagine, it was the enslaved who were taking that on, coerced to complete that work. So 
Miscegenation. If you haven't heard that word, that's a fancy word for uh, interracial marriage or interracial hmm, coming together, shall I say. And it happened. It's not new. And so people of varying races fell in love. And it wasn't always about slavery, despite the anti-miscegenation laws. You may have seen the film, The Lovings, and it uh, looked at um, the Supreme Court case that supposedly ended that um, in the states. But many states had their anti-miscegenation laws, Jim Crow laws, de jure and de facto segregation. But we are a nation of a melting pot where many people of various nationalities and races came together. Here's another example, looking at Miss Lily Carol Jackson again. This is her husband, Kiefer Jackson. And he looked white. Everyone always asks in the museum. So I am the curator of this museum, the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum in Baltimore. And um, I can see people looking and they, they want to ask, but they think it's a might think it's a rude question. So I'll go ahead and prompt them to ask. Was he white? Was she a married a white man, this civil rights fighter fighting against segregation and and um, Jim Crow laws? Well, he identified as black, but he his mother was Choctaw Indian and his father was white but his father despised him. He, you know, was another take, take, taking advantage of a woman for his own pleasure, but he didn't expect a child to come of it and for him to be responsible for that. That was just the way it was. And so um, often they had, to, they had to carry, they traveled around the country. You see him with a early camera or video camera film camera, and they would travel and show uh, films about, um, positive films about African-Americans because the films at the time that showed African-Americans always showed them as buffoons or fiends or, you know, attacking white women and all of that. And so they wanted to show uh, positive, uplifting films, Christian films, and they traveled around the country. They saw a lot of poverty, and um, a lot. They traveled in ox carts and then Model T Ford, but they had to carry their marriage certificate, which was huge. One of those big, beautiful with um, certificates with that was um, imprinted with uh, paintings and all of that. And they had to carry that around so that when they were stopped for looking like it was a miscegenation instance, they could prove that they were indeed married. And being married meant that they were both of the same race because most states did not allow mixed race marriages. So another instance of mixing. On the left, we have Caroline Highgate. She was called sometimes an octoroon. And she was the sister of Edmonia Highgate, which is the first teacher of Hosanna School Museum located in Darlington, Maryland, in Harford County. And she was a Freedmen's Bureau teacher. There, she's originally from New York, Syracuse, New York area. And then she was teaching in Louisiana and Mississippi. Then enter Albert Talman Morgan, who was from Wisconsin, an abolitionist, in fact, who is a carpetbagger, as they called him, moved to Mississippi, tried to make a go of the cotton plantation. This was during Reconstruction period, but his attempt failed. But he met, he met Caroline. Wasn't she beautiful? She was absolutely gorgeous. And of course, in Mississippi, this, they still held on to um, their segregation laws. But they married, it became a big controversy. And he even wrote a book that is used today called Yazoo or On the Picket Line of Freedom in the South. Yazoo is a county in Mississippi. And uh, he shares his, their experiences. He became a politician down there during that brief period 
when uh, in the reconstruction period, um, abolitionists and African-Americans held a lot of the political offices until of course, instances like um, Wilmington, North Carolina, where they run out of offices and the towns burn down or, or uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the entire community, people are murdered and burned down. And then, you know, they no longer are holding those offices and certainly the numbers are few today. Um, so, but enter, so they get married, they have several children, three daughters and a son. And this particular daughter, Angela Morgan, born Nina Lillian Morgan, wanted to pass as white. She and her sisters had a little group called the Morgan Sisters and then the and sometimes the Angela sisters. And because their mom was a like octoroon as she was called, or sometimes a mulatto, then um, she looked very light. And when they traveled around the country, their mom served as their chaperone. They never said that she was their mom though, because they didn't want to be identified as black. So she, most of her, all her life, passed as white, maybe not as a child, but um, she um, even changed her entire biography. You know, she changed her name, she changed her parents' name. Whenever she filled out any documents or papers, she used the other names. But we now know today her real name is Nina Lillian and her papers at the University of Michigan and all of that. But there were those who were called passers, and she was one of them. And she could get, get away with it as long as nobody suspected. And I don't think she had any children because sometimes, you know, those recessive genes come out. And then um, I've heard of an instance, I think it was in Great Britain too. It was a couple, each of them were biracial. And then the child they had, no, excuse me, they had twins. One twin looked more white and the other twin looked very black. <laughs> so those recessive genes will come out at some point. So they had all kinds of classifications, particularly in Louisiana. First of, call, of all, there was the Negro, or how should I say, maybe the Creole. We talk about Creole food, but that was if you're the first generation in America, whether European or, um, or uh, Afri of African descent. But the Negro or Negress, being a woman, was someone who didn't have any European ancestry. Then you had the mulatto. They were basically 50-50, you know, one black parent, one white parent. And then you had the Griff, or maybe it's Griffet. I haven't really heard anybody say it. And that's a person who was one quarter European descent and three quarters African descent. Then you had the quadroon one quarter African and three quarters European. Everybody getting, their complexion is getting lighter and lighter, getting closer to passing. Then the octoroon, who was one eighth African and seven eighths European. Now, nobody really did any DNA testing or maybe they knew who your parents were and their parents. But often when you look at the census, um, it was just by the census takers impression, they decided on their own whether you were mulatto or quadroon and and so that was just a something sometimes people were negro sometimes they were white and sometimes mulatto on different senses as the same person so where do you look for records i'm going to start right with the obvious the ones that i'm sure you already use but the the clues if you, I'm, I'm hoping everybody uses those clues. Those are wonderful, are invaluable. And especially if you, you know, if you open up your tree to other individuals, they, um, you'll connect with other genealogists and other people that um, might know, or their trees will become available to you. Somebody might contact you with information. I, like I said, I develop trees a lot of times on the individuals that I'm researching. So I had a tree on the Archer family and somebody contacted me and said, hey, 
And the Archer family, many of them migrated to Mississippi. And he said, you know, you might want to come visit the Prospect Hill plantation. We have a great story here. And he told me about this book called Mississippi in Africa. And this whole story about um, his name was Isaac Ross. And he was a slaveholder. He had multiple plantations. But he started um, affiliating with the American Colonization Society, which had this whole back to Africa movement. Not in a good sense. Mostly it was because many slaveholders complained about free Blacks uh, possibly influencing their enslaved individuals into um, getting involved in insurrection or riots or massacring the slaveholder and his family. So they were always uh, in this state of fear of free Blacks. So they had all these laws and and ways to suppress them and, and being free was not free in America. If you were an African-American, you um, were often subjected to, um, you know, segregation laws. You could only live in so many communities. You can only own so much land. Owning land was something everybody wanted, right? But the slaveholders, they would have slaveholder conventions in um, Maryland and Baltimore, especially on the Eastern shore. And one of the main topics was preventing the free blacks from owning any real estate. So if you wonder why today, you have to look at these issues back then and how they impact us today, were prevented from owning any land. They were prevented from having certain jobs, certainly the jobs that would lead them to any affluence. They were prevented from owning guns, owning dogs, owning pigs or anything that would make them rich or feel safe or you or you thought they might use against, against you from the point of view of the slaveholders. And so, um, so he pointed that out to me. So he, this Isaac Ross said, well, when I pass, I want you to sell one of my plantations, he told his executors, which was his one daughter and his grandson, uh, to um, sell one of my plantations and use the money to send all those of my individuals who in, I have enslaved, all my slaves, so let, give them the opportunity to, to go to Liberia. And But the grandson contested and fought and fought and his mother, which was another child and for 10 years. Then some of the enslaved, they say, got, got fed up and poisoned them at, with the coffee one night at dinner. And then they set the house on fire. But one of the young girls died in the fire in the community, lynched as many as they could and killed and caught and, and just pillaged the black community that were any free blacks anywhere. And um, eventually some did go, make it out to Liberia. And so there's a whole book that I just finished. It's also on Audible about this story and the author's uh, journey to Liberia to meet some of the descendants who became involved in politics over in Liberia. So beyond the obvious ancestry and opening it up, if you haven't done that, people reach out and tell you some very fascinating stories. And of course, find a grave. You're gonna learn about the churches and those reveal free or historically free, free black communities. Because even in, in life and in death, we were segregated. And so um, you'll find out about some of those churches, which then have cemeteries. The cemeteries, um, you're gonna follow the names, the death records, the birth records. But also know if there was a black church, remember, considering the history, depending on how far back you go, if it was considered a historically black church, like a African Methodist Episcopal church, if you hear of AME or a black Baptist church, then it's probably in a black community. 
So just think about that community and then follow the names because for example, like at Hosanna School Museum in Darlington, Lincoln, at Lincoln University, where Lincoln University was founded, there was a black church there called Hosanna. It's still there, still standing, considered uh, to be a part of the Underground Railroad. They have a little trap door and all of that. But if you look in the cemetery, many of the same names at the Hosanna Church in Darlington are at, um, at the cemetery at Hosanna in um, Lincoln. And so you can start tracing some of those individuals and find out that they were likely relatives. I mean, Harford County is right on the border. We're a border state. And then Harford County is on the border with the Susquehanna. You're not far from these uh, free, many free black communities in Pennsylvania, the free state. Then you have your historical color, color schools, which are often came out of the churches. Um, so you look at the black churches mostly, then you'll find maybe a school. And then it, from the schools, you get to the Freedmen Bureau records. And then with those records, which are now still being digitized and being indexed and it's searchable. At one point, um, uh, is it family search, uh, the, Mm. had digitized by an index by name, just search by name, but now the records are being indexed completely so that you could search by town name or the name of a school and not just by individual names. And then there were the Rosenwald schools, which would give you a sense because remember we were segregated. So these schools are placed in what are, were at the time black communities. And Rosenwald School was, um, um, oh, I can't think of his first name at the moment. Um, Julius Rosenwald, who was of Jewish descent. And he was convinced by Booker T. Washington, who started the Tuskegee uh, School, maybe it was called Tuskegee Institute, now University, uh, to use some of his money. Julius Rosenwald was, um, CEO of Sears Roebuck and Company. And he made a lot of money. And uh, they even sold house plans. And I guess part, you could, you could get a house from Sears. And of course, sort of like our, um, our mobile homes today, our mobile houses that come in parts that you buy. And he did, he, he contributed his money, but he, he um, he looked at it a lot like grants today. He said, well, I'll give uh, 25%. I want the black community to raise 25% and I want the overall community or maybe thirds to give uh, another third. So he wanted a buy-in from the community when these schools uh, were built. And there were, I forget exactly, but there are schools all over, I think, um, Harford County had maybe six or seven, and mostly in the southern states. A lot of people don't think of Maryland as southern, but it is, it was, it is. And um, um, there weren't as many in Maryland, but some, some of the states in the deep, deeper south um, had a lot of Rosenwald schools. But he also helped artists and uh, poets and all of those individuals with various funds, the Rosenwald Fund to help them advance. Then you have the AMA or the American Missionary Association, which um, that and other organizations, benevolent organizations that um, supported these colored schools as they were called um, with teachers or some, some funding to help the teachers to, and, you know, with the Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau didn't necessarily provide money. They might provide used lumber or some plans or something, or they even, in Maryland, they weren't as active. In the Deep South, they um, did more than help with schools. They helped uh, families uh, um, reunite. They 
uh, legitimized marriages because um, the many places the slaves were not allowed to marry legally. And so they um, helped them get married or helped them find lost loved ones. Uh, they helped with disputes or helped them to find work or just basic needs. And, um, and then you have your HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, all of those, if you look in those areas, you're gonna find more in those communities. And in those HBCUs, you're gonna find archives and libraries that might have some records that you might be interested in. If you can identify one that's near a community or even say, for example, the AMA records um, are in at Tulane University, the Amistad Research Center, um, which the records pertain to these Freedmen Bureau School teachers, many of them who were sent by the AMA, wrote letters back and forth. And you might have a whole collection of letters. So you find out a lot who was involved, some of the community leaders, how these buildings and churches and schools were founded. And then in those Freedmen Bureau records, also you'll find other organizations that supply teachers or help with the school. So it wasn't, the Freedmen Bureau didn't work by itself and it rarely worked without the input of the community. Really the community took the leadership and requested some assistance, just like we request assistance from grants today, especially during the pandemic right now, there's all these relief grants and we said, well, it's available, we might as well take it, but we have to take the initiative to get those funds through those organizations that are offering it and channeling it out. We're actually, when we apply for grants or they applied for Freedmen Bureau assistance, helping those organizations do what they have uh, part to really advance or realize their missions. And so um, those records are invaluable. And then of course the usual, the census records will give you a sense of the descendant communities, not just the person you're looking for. If you just look at a few sheets, see who's living next to who, who's got slaves, who doesn't. Um, you'll find all these mixed households with a free person and enslaved person and white families and different numbers. And then you might find them living next to somebody who was a free family, a free black family. And so um, it's very um, revealing in that regard to look at the several pages, not just the person you're looking for. And of course, you're gonna get names and things like that. Find out who's living in the house that may not even be a family member. Or you'll find out that they're living in a white household as a servant. And of course, the most invaluable of all are the local historical societies. I can't tell you the records. I can't, there's so many records that I can't even name because the local Historical societies might have books written by local historians that might not be online. You're not only gonna find it if you go there. Manuscript, manumission papers, petitions for freedom, just books on the communities that don't make it to Amazon, wills, land records, just, you know, then they might have an African-American historical society or a genealogical society, tap into those um, as well. But those, they might have compendiums where they've pulled records together and just um, compiled them for you for an easy search. You're not gonna, you might not find that on Amazon. So, and they, they're just gonna have so many other records, local archives and different, sometimes it's the town level, sometimes it's the county level, and then there's the state level. So you might, and then you might look at adjoining adjacent um, counties as well, and your newspapers, local and community newspapers, of course, of that community at that local historical society, they're not necessarily all gonna be digitized. But then there's accessiblearchives.com, which is a website that has a lot of um, Quaker records, local newspapers, and um, black newspapers that have been um, transcribed and so you can, and indexed so you can search for various issues or various topics 
various names. You might find out something. Our Edmonia Highgate that I mentioned earlier was the first teacher. She was a prolific writer in what was called the Christian Recorder, uh, a newspaper they called the official organ of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. And um, it was, oh, what was the book, uh, the periodical called? Hmm. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the periodical. But um, she often wrote for that. Oh, it was called the Christian Recorder. I said that. And um, she wrote in other papers. I could see she was connected with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and their writing. And they're saying, oh, Edmonia Highgate visited us today. Well, I'm not going to find that everywhere. It's not just on the internet. So you got to search those newspapers. There's newspapers.com. There's Chronicling America. All those which you are probably familiar with. Where else to look? Just look at the laws of the time. The enslaved and particularly free Blacks, as I mentioned before, were often targets of concern. They didn't like the way they lived or how they lived and certainly didn't want them to own any land. Migration patterns. You have the great migrations, a couple of them, often due to violence in Southern communities. Some Maryland, I'm on the lynching memorial, uh, lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission for here in Maryland, the first in the country. But, uh, and we work closely with the Equal Justice Initiative in um, Montgomery, which has the, some people call it the lynching museum. That's not its real name. It's, I think it's called the Legacy Museum. And looking at the legacy of slavery and the legacy of lynchings, and which leads to today our mass incarceration. And, but in that, you know, you have those decimated towns, those massacres this year, we um, commemorated the um, massacre and decimation of Tulsa, the community of Greenwood, which was often referred to as Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and how that town was bombed and all over a, a, a accusation, a false accusation and a, of a young white woman saying that this young black boy attacked her in the elevator. Although actually she denied the charges, but someone else trumped them up and it just got out of control. And um, to this day, I mean, in 1919, that was called uh, Red Summer. That year alone, there were about 20 some odd town massacres where African-American communities were just ravaged, pillaged, and people were murdered and lynched. And besides towns like that, there are towns where they've been flooded underwater. They no longer exist. And there's always a highway going through a black community. So if you look at a big highway, you might wonder, was there a black community here? Because they always, that's one of the ways they'll um, um, get rid of a black community is to condemn it and then say, you know, uh, or through eminent domain. And that's how they get rid of a black community. But if you look further back, you'll find it. And then you might be able to get some of the history if you knew what was there before. And so um, cemeteries covered up, we have the Native American Graves uh, Protection Act, and there's an effort to have one for African-American cemeteries. So here in Maryland, the Laurel Park Cemetery, which had many famous African-Americans, was covered up by a parking lot and a shopping center in Baltimore, and there's there were Miss Lily Carol Jackson was one of the people fighting against it. Others fought, but under the table dealings, the developers were able to do it. And, um, you know, there's an effort to try to uh, recover the names of those individuals. They so called lost the records just so descendant families couldn't make any claims or, or sue them because they couldn't prove that they were buried there. 
And that has happened in many places in the United States. So knowing where the communities were and where people were buried, seeing if any um, cemeteries were covered up either by a shopping center, some kind of development, or flooded. Here uh, in the Darlington area, you have the Conowingo Dam, which flooded out uh, several of the communities, black communities, white communities. You have Aberdeen Proving Ground, which uh, through eminent domain, got rid of some of the communities and the, the farms there. They were black and white. Uh, but when um, the families were offered some money, compensation for the loss of their land, African-Americans were treated differently. They were offered less money. And because of the laws of the time, they were restricted as to where they could move. It was restricted. Maybe they received here. Many of them had um, been given land. One particular slaveholder, Freeborn Garrison, uh, during this is around the Revolutionary War time, well before the Civil War, he did not want to fight. He wanted to become a Methodist minister, and he inherited slaves from his father. But he said, "Nope, I don't want to own anybody." I'm going to free them and I'm going to give them some of my land. So he parceled off his land. So some of these African-Americans living in that area had this land given to them and it was passed down to their families. Now, of course, we were an agrarian society. So they had big farms in order to sustain themselves and to sell and trade and whatever. Um, now the laws have restricted how much, how much acreage they could buy. They could only buy I think it was up to, it was either one or three acres of land. Well, you can't do much farming on that. And so you have to look at the communities that are lost. Some of those Freeman Bureau records will name towns and communities that are no longer existing. And then there's the second middle passage, as we call it. Who was sold south? There was Manifest Destiny and Westwood Expansion to try to, you know, all the, the places that, you know, Texas, Mississippi's growing. So many of the people I mentioned, the archers migrated um, to Mississippi, Louisiana and Alabama and Missouri as well. And so um, look at that westward expansion. Now, some of the states ha had slavery, some were not, they side voted against slavery, but they also voted against any free African Americans living in their state. So those are referred to as the white states or the sundown towns where you couldn't enter that state after a certain time of day. And some still exist, whether it be de jure or de facto, they still exist. And we talked a little bit before about the Freedmen's Bureau records. And in those, you, um, amongst those, or in addition to those, are the Freedmen's Aid Bank. Those applications are very revealing. This was started, uh, or it was an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau, but it was run by a white man. And then he started pilfering and taking money, calling himself investing and getting his buddies involved. And they ended up losing all the money that the African-Americans were saved. African-Americans, especially the former Union soldiers, USCT, United States Colored Troop, were encouraged, learn to save, put your money in this bank, we'll help you out. But they lost all their money. And even today, if you look that up, it's um, the Treasury Department is in that building, I think today, and they renamed the building in um, recognition of what happened. And where else? Those Christian and educational organizations I mentioned, the AMA. And then there was one here called the Baltimore Association for the Moral and Educational Improvement of the Colored People. When you look at those Freedmen Bureau records, they show you all the, they'll ask all these questions. They have all these reports, monthly reports the teachers had to give. And then there were supervisor reports and uh, adju adjutant general reports. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And um, 
if you look at those, you'll see the different organizations that supported those schools. If you find all their records, if you're looking, you look at a person, they were sent by the Baltimore Association, then go find the Baltimore Association records. You might find that they have some reports. You might find other things that happen. And then of course, there's the benevolent organizations, um, the Masons, the Eastern Star, VFWs, or the segregated black VFWs and posts and fraternities and sororities, because just remember we are America and segregation is real or was real, de facto real. And then William Stills, the Underground Railroad, reveals many slaveholders. So just for Hartford County alone, William Still wrote this book. He lived in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. He was part of the um, Abolition Society there. And um, they, the Vigilance Committee, I think it was called, that he was part of. And he would, the individuals who made it through the Underground Rail Railroad, who came through him that he helped, he um, would take notes in a notebook. One of his objectives was to try to reunite families. So he would find out what plantation they were from, who the slaveholders was, ask them about their experiences, get their real names. Sometimes they were under different names to uh, protect their identity. And their stories are in there. And um, in Hartford County alone, I, I've not completed my search, but I found more than 60 individuals who um, are documented in William Still's book. And that is also how we got the first site of in Hartford County on the National Park Service Network to Freedom. I saw it in William Still's book. And it was the story of Sam Archer, who had been enslaved by Thomas Hayes, who um, had a home, which is now in Bel Air. His home was in Bel Air, which is now Harford Community College. That historic home is still uh, was restored by the college, and they use it for historical and cultural programming. But that house is now on the Network for Freedom because I saw it in. William Still's book, and it gave me a lot of information. And then, because they had um, created exhibition and done some research on the house and who lived there, they had um, family trees, they had wills, they saw who, who had been enslaved there, was able to match it all up and prove that he had been enslaved there. And um, so, don't forget this book. This book is almost 800 pages thick and very interesting, very revealing. And it's available on um, Amazon, uh, Kindle. It's also, I'm listening to it actually now um, through Audible because I'd never really read it cover to cover. It's really not that kind of a book, but I thought I might, you know, just listen to those stories. And Quaker or Friends records, especially the abolitionists. They tell a lot about the communities and who was uh, involved, who helped who, and then incidents that may not have made his, um, made it into mainstream narrative or history books. So just this past weekend, Bellevue Farm in Haverty Grace, Maryland, um, had a big open house. And when the county purchased the property, they were not aware of the story of its involvement in the Christiana resistance, a big event that um, let, was a standoff up between a Baltimore County slaveholder and formerly enslaved from Maryland and other places who were living in Christiana, Pennsylvania, a big standoff. And then he ends up getting killed. All these people get um, charged with treason. It culminates into the largest treason trial in US history and involves many people we know, uh, including Frederick Douglass, who helped uh, some of them escape to Canada after the incident, including Thaddeus Stevens, uh, um, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens. If you saw the film Lincoln, he was the one who really pushed, that was what Tommy Lee Jones character pushing for the 13th Amendment. And um, 
he was the defense attorney and he incidentally passed the bar in Bel Air, Maryland, which is where our historical society is in Bel Air. And just some big name people, well, they weren't aware of this big story. And also about two days prior, just um, it was um, successful in becoming another property in Harford County on the network to freedom. Because of all, William still documents it, but all these other records document it as well. And military records, you all know about those. Um, but keep in mind that they were, the militaries were segregated. So the records are revealing in different ways. Uh, the USCT records, that's United States Colored Troops because of the segregated armed forces. So, you know, you're gonna get your hometown, relatives, age, etc. And many people were manumitted. I mentioned the manumission records in the local historical societies because they agreed to fight for the union in the civil war. Iris? Yes. Chris has a question. He said the narratives that were done by former slaves, where are those kept? Can they be cross-referenced by those that were from Harford County? You talking about William Stills records? Um, we, narratives? No, I'm talking about the narratives that were done by the uh, by the uh, former slaves um, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, those are what the National Archives, I believe, has those. And if you do look under Maryland, you might find some. And yes, those would be revealing also. Mm -hmm. I don't Safe believe we narrative. have those at the historical society. I'm I'm not aware of any at the historical society. There, some some uh, historians have compiled them and done some interpretation from them, you know, by state. Um, so those are pretty readily available um, through various books and through the National Archives. But I'm not aware of any at the historical society. Are Are you? No. Um. That's why I was asking you. <laughs> no, I haven't come across any there. And then, um, did that, Iris, uh, yes, another question? Uh, have you had any, um, had any success with the uh, Library of Congress and their holdings for finding information? Because a, a lot of times I find like, privately published books and uh, are available at Library of Congress. And I've, I've found a lot of information that I haven't found anywhere else there. They also have digital access to newspapers and different things like that. Have yes, you had any luck there? Yes, they're chronicling America, which is um, various newspapers. They have various exhibitions where they'll um, digitized records that would be online. But I mean, you'd have to have some kind of hint that the records are there. I wouldn't just go there um, without knowing that you're looking for something specific to, for a person or a, a book because they just have so many things. You can look online to see what books they have or the photographs they have. They do have some things divided into sections um, by topic, but um, it's a huge resource and certainly valuable, particularly for the newspapers. Or if you want to, you take a name and you search through there just to see if something pops up. Uh, take a town name, take a school name, take a, you know an event and see what pops up. Certainly, um, it's it's definitely a resource to. Um, see what pops up. Of course, Google it by itself, just Googling a topic or a person's name, you might come up with something that you didn't expect somebody else might've been researching or writing a book about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was it for the, you know, the, the main places to look as well as the ones that we just mentioned that are pretty general. You can look for anything in there. National Archives, 
there's a actually the National Archives has a book on remember these are national records or uh at the National Archives, but they go beyond that and that, or shall I say, in looking at those records, um, you know, if you they're revealing also. So um if you're looking for something in the newspapers, you know, you're gonna have to look for hints. Because of the Jim Crow laws and segregation, they often would say Negro this or colored so-and-so or put it in parentheses after the person's name. And so then you know is that if you're looking for that person that you got the right person because if they have the same name as somebody else, but that would often give you a, um, some confirmation that that was likely the person you were looking for because they were always identifying that they were black in some way or another. And um, National Archives has a book by Dr. Deborah Newman Ham. I think she was maybe Newman then, that um, tells you how you can use those records um, for African-American research in those records and how revealing and the ways in which they are revealing. She did, the, uh, she did, I think, something similar for the Library of Congress as well. Okay. What um, other questions? Let me turn my screen off. Okay, I don't see any here. Chris, what records do we have at the Historical Society specific on the, um, African-American history in Harf County? Uh, what we have is probably one of the most uh, probably detailed collections as towards original records. Uh, we have the uh, Certificates of Freedom uh, from the early part of the 19th century uh, on up until the Civil War. Uh, we also have the manumissions uh, as well as the Bill of Sale. Uh, those are uh, those two items are in the um, archives collection. Um, those are the originals. Um, Carolyn Greenfield Adams uh, several years ago did a publication uh, where she uh, used uh, the work by the late Hunter Sutherland, who was a, a past member, of, I believe, president of the Historical Society. Uh, that work in itself is only a fraction of what actually is there. Um, a lot of the early manumissions and bills of sale were recorded among the land records of Parker County. Uh, each counties are different. Uh, so that's basically what we did here. Um, so those are not... Uh, um, and use the regular and record type index. We actually have to go by the actual uh, individual library books to actually find these documents. Um, so we probably have several hundred or more in the archives. Now, whether we actually have copies of all of them, uh, uh, originals, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so it, it's worthy of a publication that an addendum be done uh, uh, of information in the items uh, not only uh, information from the person about their freedom also uh, how they were freed uh, in the first place what families actually may have given you clues to what families actually own them um, so uh, thanks. In the in the wills, are they normally listed in the wills or in the chattel? During, chattel the, during the wills, during the chattels, they're in a wide variety of different things. Um, another book that was named that we had a lot of uh, interactions in Hartford County, especially during that period of time in, in history, is Blood Money by uh, Ralph Clayton. And um, we, we had the individuals that were here in Maryland that were involved in the transactions of uh, selling 
uh, individuals back to the South. Uh, and that book is available, uh, I believe, on the Amazon. Uh, um, and it's very pricey. It's about 50 or $60 for the book. So, um, Which book is that? Blood Money. Blood Money. Oh, okay, I know he had another one, Cash. Um, hmm, I can't think I of it. Ralph that. Clayton is one that wrote it. Okay. Blood and Money. There's some uh, there's some slave masters and holders out of Baltimore that we're doing. We I I have seen their names mentioned uh, in the uh, bills of sale here in Hartford County uh, that that he has in the book. But they were based out of Baltimore doing transactions here. I think it's called Cash for Blood. Maybe that's that what it's called. Yeah, I was going to say, does he have a second book? <laughs> yeah, it's called Cash for Blood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, each historical society is going to have a different set of records. So really just ask and look through all the records. Just go one by one. Look on the shelf because they're going to have individual publication for about the town, about individuals and those binders that you're not going to find anywhere else. And that's, um, you're just going to have to make a trip if you are not, you know, physically close to where you're, the people you are researching, where they would have lived. Um, so probably one of the big things that we have here in Carver County, uh, being south of the Mason-Dixon line, is we had a lot of families go south. Uh, we had, uh, especially, uh, with the Archer family, uh, Stevenson Archer, who was one of the judges here in Harper County, became the territorial governor of Mississippi. Uh, and several of his children uh, actually stayed down there. And uh, one of them, uh, his son James, lived in Mississippi um, and has quite a few descendants. Uh, and what they would do was they were corresponding back and forth between uh, the relatives in the South and the relatives in Maryland. And they were back to They would send the kids up here to school. Um, I've actually seen letters that were written by different members of the family back and forth between uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, two of the ones in Baltimore, and here in Harford County. Um, so probably one of the more well-known descendants that was from the South was General John Archer Lejeune. So I should say, maybe it was implied, but I didn't say, you're going to find, so there aren't many African-American diaries or wills or anything like that. When I'm talking about these wills and these records and land records, these are of the slaveholders, and you're going to have to look through their records to find the black people because right. they have very few of their own records. Number one, they were not allowed to read and write. Number two, they couldn't use the court system the same way. And um, so you're not gonna find as much that they generated personally that's in the court system. Somebody did it on their behalf or they're in some other records. So to look for some people you know, if you can find out who they were enslaved by, those are the records you need to look at, the enslavers' records. And um, that's where you're going to find them or get, get, find out where they may have lived, what they may have done. And, um, and hopefully you get lucky and find a good cache of records that tell you a lot. You know, their, their regular correspondence, all of that. And you know, there's some records in Doc South. So I was looking up some records for, you know, I ended up in the University of North Carolina and Duke University had records about individuals in Hartford County. And, and of course, um, you know, just look at where I migrate. You have to look at all those records. But uh, as Chris mentioned, lots of letters back and forth talking about what they did. And they're not always just in that town. Uh, depending on who had the records and where they decide to donate them, 
So there's that whole Doc South initiative, which looks at, um, has a lot of records pertaining to individuals who were enslavers or enslaved. Probably one of the bigger collections, but one of the collections, especially with individuals involved with the Historical Society was the founder, founding president of the Historical Society where his stuff is actually, uh, I believe at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Williamson Ford. So when he wrote, wrote a, a considerable amount of items. Uh, so why it's down there, I have no clue. Um, yes, yes, he has uh, lots of books. And then, uh, and some records over at Duke University as well, is um, especially Stump was a stump forward because he was um, using um, making father, medical claims to justify right. slavery and right. writing medical journals and he and individuals. And so those are at Duke University. And, um, you know, it's always follow the trails, extract the names and keep going. It's, it could be ongoing. I know genealogy and just, you could just find so much and you think, I know sometimes when I would get on a trail, I'd stay up half the night because I wanted to finish. There's no finishing. <laughs> right. you continue to look. You say, well, shucks, I could have gone to sleep because I still have so much more and you're not going to finish. You just, you know, you might hit a little dead end. Sometimes I go back and look at Ancestry and I have all these new hints. Where were those hints before? At Sunny Dello. So. If you go into Ancestry Search and the card catalog, you can look at the current or the records that they've updated. And so that way you can pinpoint your search into the new records that they've updated since the last time you were on there. Okay. So go in. They have lots of new yearbooks. I found yes. myself all my yearbooks digitized. I'm like, oh, well, I don't have a yearbook anymore, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. And I'm finding relatives. I'm finding out some of those skeletons, like about one uncle. And we thought he was married to his wife. Well, he wasn't. They didn't get married until way later. I guess they had been cohabitating for a long time. And, <laughs> and you know, instances you find out somebody wasn't so-and-so's real father. It was, you know, or that wasn't their mother. That was their aunt. Or that was not their sister. That was their mother. And it's all very real. And you try to use those nice little, nice little family tree, those pre-printed family trees. You can't. I was trying to create something for my family to do uh, scrapbooks. And I had to create it myself because the branches were so irregular. <laughs> you can't, it's hard to buy one of those commercial family trees and it worked nice and cleanly. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't, I don't see any from I know. at all. No, nobody's curious about anything. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. well, um, well, Iris, you, you opened up another question for me because as you may have noted in my presentation, I have uh, ancestors who care. I did hear that. Yes. I did hear that. Yes. I so I'm thinking, what's the Doregan Manor? They come out of, that's where Lily Carol Jackson's people come from. I, I've, I'm still working on that line. It took me a long time to get through to, um, to that family because I was searching in Philadelphia uh, because that's where my uh, great, great grandmother was born, Katie Carroll. Um, mm. And I was searching all over her, uh, Philadelphia for information and um, it ended up one day I was at the Historical Society and I looked up K Carol and all of the Carol family was right here in Harford County. So uh, that was something I've just recently connected to and I'm still searching those records, but yeah, I'm, I never have- Never ending, never ending. Always a new branch, a new leaf. <laughs> 
So, um, oh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little break. Um, I have to get Uda Allers, my our next presentation online. Thank you, Iris. That was amazing. You're um, welcome. Thank you for that information, and thank you everybody for joining us. Hope and, to see you sometime soon. And during the break, uh, you don't have to touch anything. You don't have to leave. Um, you know, take a Bye, break. Bye, everybody. Uh, get some.